This is CBC Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain, live in Mount Pearl, at the scene of where there was a really horrible fire here today, one that's going to have an impact on food banks across the province. Have details on that coming up. And I'm Debbie Cooper in the studio. A fire at the Community Food Sharing Association's main warehouse is our top story tonight. And we do have extensive coverage. So, Anthony, back to you in Mount Pearl. Well, Debbie, as you know, CBCNL, radio, television, here and now, we have a very special relationship with the Food Sharing Association, and that's going to be put to the test again, and that's because of what happened today. This has major implications, not just for here in Mount Pearl and St. John's, because this is really one of the hubs for food collection. And to get a sense of just what happened today, I'm going to bring in CBC reporter Katie Breen. Katie's been here for a good chunk of the day, speaking to people, getting to really the, the, what matters here and what it means. So, Katie, what is the story here? Well, the story is just heartbreak. I met the Community Food Sharing Association manager, Egg Walters, here today. I've also met him in the past, just before Christmas. As you mentioned, we have a big food drive. I came down, took a tour of the warehouse, and the place was just full because Christmas really is a big time for food banks. It's yeah. when a lot of the donations come in, and it's really what keeps them going through the whole winter. The warehouse was three quarters full when it caught fire today. Hundreds of thousands of dollars of donations destroyed. They had just gotten three tractor trailer loads of food from Food Banks Canada. Now, none of it is salvageable. And they were just getting ready to ship a lot of it out. It's devastating, actually, because, you know, we, we have absolutely no food. We don't even have one can of soup now that we could, we could distribute. The uh, tremendous amount of water damage and smoke damage. But it's not only the the food that we lost, but we've certainly lost our, our warehouse space. And with the damage that's been done in there, it's, it's certainly not going to be ready anytime soon. Walter says workers were inside when they heard a bang and saw flames. They ran upstairs to let people at other businesses know everyone got out safely. Walters is thankful for that, but this is no doubt a devastating blow to food banks across the province. Certainly, it's going to put a dent in the ability of food banks to meet the immediate day-to-day uh, -day needs over the next uh, week or two uh, with, uh, throughout the province. We're hoping that uh, someone comes forward and offers us some warehouse space. And we've got groups out there that are going to be holding food drives for us. And hopefully, that will get us back on our feet. Of course, the CBC wow. had a big fundraiser for uh, the Community Food Sharing Association back in December, Feed and L. And the plan, I guess, is to help to, to bring that back in a way. Absolutely. And if you actually go to the CBC website, cbc.ca slash NL, and you scroll down and get to our community page, that's where you'll see a big donate now button. And I've got to say, for those of you who are watching tonight, uh, you were extremely generous at the end of 2018. And obviously, the Food uh, Sharing Association, they really need some help again. As, uh, as Egg said, poor Egg. It's, 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 he's, he's heartbroken. it's heartbreaking to see yeah. Egg Walters like that. And as he pointed out, it's not just the food, but where are they going to put the food once they make up for the three truckloads that are gone. So check out that page and you can make a donation if you want. I know it's we were asking you to do this in 2018, but obviously there's a great need here. And if you can do anything, a loony, a few, a couple, some companies have given a lot of money today. Whatever you can do will help the Food Sharing Association. Now later on here and now, we're going to talk to somebody else who runs another food bank to really give you a sense of the implications. Doesn't look like major devastation here behind us in this gray building, but what happened today is really going to have an impact. Stay tuned for that later. After only four months of being open, this private cannabis retailer is closing. He said, you know, Tina, he said, uh, sorry, we had to miss you this time. We only had so many cases around and we had to look after the other guys. You can hear more of that story coming up on Here and Now. Well, a little bit of a messy evening as we head towards the morning hours. A wintry mix on the way for Newfoundland. That spells heavy snow for parts of northern Labrador as well. We've got some blowing snow advisories in place. Could see as much as 15 to 20 centimeters of snow by the time tomorrow morning rolls around. And then we start to see some cooler air move in. That means we're going to see a snow squall set up, and that's going to happen tomorrow through Friday. So we'll have all those details, how much snow we're expecting when I come back in a bit. Deb? 
Thanks, Ashley. Well, one of only six independently licensed marijuana shops in the province is shutting down. A Clarenville store says issues with suppliers and a lack of government support is putting them out of business after just four months. As here now as Meg Roberts reports, they're not alone. So that is 3161. Have you used this product before? This is Tina Greening's last day working at Puff Puff Pass Head Shop in Clarenville. The store closes at 8 o'clock tonight. Greening, the business manager, says if she knew then what she knows now, she would have never opened a cannabis shop. All tallied, my sales, we might have made $40, $50 profit yesterday. And yesterday I was here for a 12-hour shift, right? So you see what's happening here. Greening says suppliers are picking favorites with larger corporate stores, making it impossible to get the quantity and quality of marijuana she needs in an already undersupplied market. They kept telling me, you know, sorry, Tina, don't have anything for you yet. Sorry, Tina, nothing's available for Newfoundland. Then uh, just before Christmas, my employee here went into the store just two minutes away, the SO, and they were stocked to the rafters. It's so frustrating, so frustrating, because as a, as a private retailer, we are the ones that assumed all the risks to, uh, to get a cannabis license. Greening says she's sitting on about $25,000 worth of product, but it's pot no one wants to buy. Customers tell her it's not strong enough. Greening says when she purchases from suppliers, she often receives lower-end products she didn't ask for and says she can't get her money back. There was a great opportunity here. It's gone, it's done. Although this private cannabis retailer in Holyrood is not closing its doors anytime soon, the owner says he's not surprised that these smaller shops are going out of business. He says he's having very similar issues to the ones that Puff Puff passes. Zach Hudson at the Reef Cannabis Shops' as owners knew of the risks of the industry, including shortages, but he believes big businesses have an unfair advantage. That was kind of what we were, were promised starting off is that, you know, there's not going to be incentives to go from one store to another. It is going to be a plain, uh, fair playing field. Everybody will have access to the same um, suppliers from the same list, uh, but we haven't seen that yet. If things continue as they are, um, you're going to see the independent shut down and it will just be a corporate run operation. Hours before her shop doors close for good, Greening says she still doesn't know what to do with the leftover product. She's asking the government to step up to make real changes so the five remaining private retailers might have a chance. Meg Roberts, CBC News, Clarenville. Now, the CBC took some of Tina Greening's questions to the NLC today. The corporation says it does not have insight on the relationships that are developed between the suppliers and the retailers. However, the NLC says this was the first time they've heard of both the THC level concerns and the favoritism. A spokesperson said the NLC has advised suppliers that they need to provide the exact THC levels to the retailer before they purchase. She also mentioned the NLC is not aware of any special deals. The suppliers' contracts are such that they need to service all their licensed cannabis retailers. So we do reiterate to all suppliers that allocation of products must be done fairly for all the retailers. The man accused of the first-degree murder of Chantel John was in court this morning. Kirk Keeping is being held in St. John's, but was in front of a judge in Grand Falls, Windsor by video link. His hearing was pushed back two weeks because lawyers are waiting for more information from the RCMP. Keeping has not entered a plea and no trial date has been set. The family of Chantel John drove for two hours from Con River for the short hearing. Sad for what we have to come to see what happened to my niece. See the man that did this to her and hope that he get the time that he deserved for what he'd done and put our family through. How, how is your family doing? It's been a couple of days since we've been down and talking to some of the family. How have your family been doing the last two weeks? They have some hard days, hard nights. People got to go to the clinic for medication. And it's like it's a constant reminder when you drive past a place and Think about he came into our community and did this to one of our people. 
We have an update tonight on the massive oil spill at the White Rose oil field two and a half months ago. Husky has started oil production once again. It also has a plan in place to remove the piece of equipment that was involved in the spill. Here now is Carolyn Stokes spoke with the company's senior VP today. I'm going to call it a milestone. This won't be a celebration. That milestone is twofold. The first is getting the oil flowing again after a two and a half month shutdown. We'll take this in a, a measured steps. This is the first well. We'll leave this online for some days to make sure that the facility is warmed up and everything is working as it should be. And the second milestone will be retrieving the connector on the ocean floor that broke, spilling 250,000 liters of oil. It will be an operation that is not without risk. And as we take those nuts and bolts off, there is a potential for oil to come to surface. We prepared for any size of leak uh, with the oil boom and the equipment that we have. Our expectations are that uh, it'll be in the terms of litres, um, tens of litres if, if that, to come out of this component. All the regulatory agencies, including the CNLOPB, have given Husky the green light to remove the connector and plug up the line using an underwater robot. The oil company knows it has a lot riding on that work. We plan for the worst, um, and, and that's the best way to look at anything. Uh, we know the consequences of releasing volumes of oil to sea, and uh, so we plan for that. Husky isn't sure yet when the operation will take place because they need 48 hours of clear skies and calm seas. So we will have um, the uh, boom, oil collection boom, deployed. Mm -hmm. We'll have aerial surveillance. We have wildlife observers on board the, um, the vessels. Uh, we have bird scaring systems to make sure that birds aren't around whilst we do this activity. And once all that work is done, Husky needs to figure out how to put a new connector in its place. Carolyn Stokes, CBC News, St. John's. Road building and paving companies in this province like the new way government is going about tendering road-related work. A five-year approach to tendering started a few years ago, and the Industry Association says both contractors and taxpayers benefit from it. The Provincial Heavy Civil Association hosted an update on the rest of the plan for this year's road contracts. Most of this year's plan was unveiled last year, something road builders lobbied for. The earlier tenders make it easier for businesses to plan, gear up and hire staff. The association says it takes away the uncertainty and reduces the risk. Anytime risk comes down, the uh, margins will come down and everybody gets, uh, gets more uh, for their dollar, no, no question about that. I believe last year, I, I believe it's fair to say that the government was surprised with some of the savings they saw in the road work budget. You know, last year we, we seen significant enough savings. We were able to do, to take projects that would have been in, would have been construction projects for this year and do them in last construction season. And case in point, there, there's one actually in Kings Point. And, and actually one of the projects that we pulled ahead from, from this year would have been Salmon Air Line uh, to the north. And that project actually got completed last year. So, you know, any savings that we're seeing, we're just reinvesting. The latest polling numbers put the province's liberals and progressive conservatives in a statistical tie. The numbers come from Main Street Research, which surveyed 583 residents over two days in January. They show among decided and leaning voters, the liberals have 42 percent support, while the PCs have 43.3 percent. Now, when the 4 percent margin of error is factored in, the parties are considered to be in a statistical tie. The poll shows the NDP have just over 11 percent support. The results do have that margin of error, plus or minus 4 percent, and is considered accurate 19 times out of 20. More details from this poll are on our website. Go to cbc.ca slash nl. Well, the board overseeing the upcoming Labrador Winter Games has reversed the decision to give naming rights of events to corporate sponsors. The change of heart came after the name Nalcor Northern Games was assigned to one event, a showcase of traditional Inuit sports. Here now is Jacob Barker explains. Well, the title Nalcor Northern Games was a short-lived one indeed. Nalcor and the Muskrat Falls project can be a very divisive topic here in Labrador and many weighed in with their disapproval. The Labrador Winter Games board 
heard the feedback and changed course quickly. There was a fair a lot of concern uh, within the community of Labrador. So, uh, you know, we're a volunteer board operating and trying to uh, put the games off in, in, in a very friendship fashion. Uh, we took everybody's concerns and, and we dealt with it immediately uh, to reverse that so that uh, people would feel comfortable again in uh, being a part of the game. The board wants to be clear that the Labrador Winter Games title was never up for a change. The event in question, the Northern Games, as it's now known again, is just one part of the game, and it's quite a spectacle to see. Impressive both because of the athleticism that is required and because it's a display of traditional games played by the Inuit of Labrador. Now, of course, relationship with the Labrador Winter Games is hardly new. It goes back 15 years. In the past, though, naming rights has not been a perk that was offered, and moving forward, it is no longer on the table. What we did not uh, accommodate for was the fact that you know people were going to be upset with, with this change. So uh, what we did uh, was we reviewed the whole situation in terms of the sponsorship package that we had out, and decided we, you know, for the betterment of the games and, and the fact that the games are friendship games. What we decided to do was to uh, take out the opportunity for sponsors to name a sport and have their names only associated as a sponsor of that sport. The platinum level of sponsorship that Nalcor is providing to the games comes with at least a $30,000 price tag. Some people that we spoke with who disagreed with the name admitted all sponsorship money is greatly appreciated and without it, events like these couldn't take place. Well, Nalcor has told us that without doubt, it will be continuing its platinum level support of the games. And for the corporation, it's about giving back to the community and supporting the athletes that compete in the games. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay.
This weather forecast is brought to you by Newfoundland and Labrador Tourism. 5,000 kilometers of groomed trails are waiting to be explored. Embrace winter today. Welcome back. And uh, Ashley, we're not going to see that beautiful winter fluffy white in our area anyway overnight, are we? No, that's uh, not at all what we're going to see. And actually, we won't really see any of that until maybe tomorrow night. But we'll we'll jump into uh, the satellite and radar. We can already start to see the snow make its way in on for the southwest coast. And we're going to continue to see that spread further north and west as we head uh, north and east, rather, as we head through the night tonight. The snow that's happening up through Labrador right now will uh, get even more heavy as we head through the night tonight as well. So taking a look at the temperatures right now, we are going to see a little bit of a mess and that's because these temperatures are actually going to climb through the night tonight right now sitting in the minus single digits up through Labrador uh, mild. So about seasonal for Labrador City at minus 15 and then heading towards the coast. Those temperatures still in the minus single digits. But as I mentioned, those temperatures are going to climb. So it should be about two degrees for Port of Basque by the time tomorrow morning rolls around zero for Cornerbrook and then generally sitting between minus one and one for central towards the Avalon as well. And that's why we're going to see a little bit of a mess tonight. So here's a look at the temperatures by the time tomorrow morning rolls around for Happy Valley Goose Bay minus four Nain climbing to minus three and then Labrador City not moving too much, but still going to see that temperature around minus 12 by morning. Some southwest winds upwards of about 40 kilometers per hour. So taking a look at the future tracker, we can see how quickly that system moves around with it generally through uh, parts of central is where we're going to see everything change from snow to ice pellets, potentially even freezing rain, and then the potential for some drizzle in the morning hours. You can see how quickly that moves away, though, and then another system moves in bringing that potential for more snow through the day on Thursday and that quickly moves in and then we start to get into a snow squall setup. So here's a look at the warnings right now. Wind warnings, those winds will significantly pick up through the overnight tonight and then drop off by morning, but still going to see gusts between 100 and 120 kilometers per hour, mainly around the rec house area. And then up through Labrador, where we're going to see most of that snow. We've got blowing snow advisories for Labrador City and Nain. So Here's what I'm thinking forecast wise. Mainly going to see snow ice pellet mixture from the first system tonight between two to four centimeters along the west coast. South coast could see that potential to change over terrain mainly towards the coast, but otherwise we're going to see that snow ice pellet freezing rain. Not a whole lot in the way of accumulation trace, maybe four centimeters at the most, but it still does look like it should be messy. And then freezing rain to rain potentially for the Avalon and that we should start to see the potential for freezing rain after midnight tonight. Otherwise, that's going to be snow up through Labrador, so a good 10 to 15 centimeters is possible. Northern Labrador, though, could see uh, accumulations upwards of about 20 centimeters, and then we'll see a couple centimeters by uh, tomorrow morning for the southeastern portion of the of Labrador, and then some more snow as that next system rolls in. So tomorrow for the Avalon and parts of Central, we'll see those temperatures above zero. And then they will drop towards the evening, but we're going to start to see those cooler temperatures right by the time the morning rolls around for the West Coast. And that's why we're going to start to see that snow squall set up. So here's a look at uh, Labrador minus 23 by morning or rather uh, through the afternoon and then eventually those temperatures will drop for the rest of Labrador as well. So I mentioned that snow squall setup. I'll have all those details when I come back. Deb. Thanks, Ashley. Well, the province has reversed its position on where publicly funded cataract surgeries can be can be performed. Rather, last year it made a regulatory change so that public hospitals were the only places these eye surgeries could be performed. Here now is Mark Quinn explains today's changes. Last year, the province's health minister went on a campaign to root out what he feared was illegal behavior. Uh, there are uh, potential criminal uh, activities involved here. The provincial government was receiving reports that patients were being asked to pay out of pocket for a service that MCP pays for, cataract surgery. The province asked people to call if they believed they were being asked to pay for a publicly funded service, and the health department received hundreds of calls. Then the province went a step further. Healthcare regulations were changed to ensure that all cataract surgeries must be done in a hospital. But today, that change was scrapped. We're going to allow ophthalmologists to perform cataract surgeries 
outside of hospitals in approved clinics. Hagee says it's the result of talks with the group that represents doctors in this province. A discussion about when it makes sense to allow some insured medical services to be done in private clinics. Today, the Medical Association says it's pleased with this change. We have an aging population. We know there's a wait list for cataract surgery already. The wait list is only going to go up as our population ages, so this will really help. Last year, people rallied in Cornerbrook to support eye doctor Justin French after the province rejected his private clinic proposal. Speaking with CBC News this afternoon, French said he now hopes to open a private clinic in western Newfoundland, a clinic that will provide eye care, including cataract surgery. Mark Quinn, CBC News, St. John's. Behind those two boarded up doors at this time last night, rows of neatly piled food, thousands of pounds of it. Today, because of the fire this morning, destruction, charred soup cans, burnt macaroni, nothing but destruction. It has a major impact on food distribution in this province. I'm going to meet somebody who can tell you more about that. That's coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now, live from Mount Pearl. I'm Anthony Germain here uh, with Sandra Milmore. And Sandra's got an interesting, pers interesting perspective when it comes to food distribution in the province because you're responsible for more than just one location, right? I am. Uh, I'm the president of particular council. We have uh, uh, eight conferences, Society St. Vincent Paul, across the province from here to Corner Brook. We have four in St. John's. Right. We have uh, one in Harbor Grace, Carboneer, Grand Falls, and Corner Brook. So give me a sense, uh, Sandra, how, how does this place, this building behind us, what happened here today, what effect will it have on those uh, those other places you mentioned? Because that's really right across the island, right? Yeah, we're a small group of Society St. Vincent Paul, but there's 54 food banks across the island who depend on this service. 54? Yes, 54. And there's also a Mirror's Kitchen that operates out of uh, Corner Brook. Well, they're involved a little bit as well. But um, the devastation of this loss today is going to be impacted a lot of people because we serve like I said 27,000 people across the island. Right. Can you give me a give give me a sense of what it's like right now because I think most of us when we're trying to help Egg Walters and this and this great organization we're sort of thinking we don't want to just do it for Christmas we want to get some generosity no. to make it last for the year. This is the end of January as you can tell it's very cold out. It is cold. What's what's demand like this time of year? Demand is increasingly not only this time of year but we've seen an increase over the fall the summer. Uh, this time of year, especially with the light bills going up and the heat and the cold, uh, people are in dire need. And this food lost today, and, and like the trucks came in today, and of course it's gone. So Egg sends all this stuff out of the road to all across Newfoundland and Labrador, and uh, it's going to have a major impact on people who are needing this food. Right. I guess just to reiterate that point, I was talking to some of the people that say, so there were several trucks, transport trucks that arrived recently? Apparently they came today. I hadn't heard, uh, heard all the news today, but apparently they arrived today and that would have been packed up to be distributed across the island and Labrador. Right. So uh, for that loss today alone, it's going to be devastating to the people who need it. Yeah, we're talking about the long term, but let's just talk about the next 48 hours. So if there were three truckloads of food scheduled to be given to people, what, what's happening to them? They're going to do it out, which is unfortunate. And the need, I'm telling you, it is, it is dire. And right. this today is disastrous to the are needy in the province. All right. So trying to be positive and it's difficult. So tomorrow's a new day. Tomorrow's a new day. What has to happen? Well, I'm going to put out a call to every organization across the island. Uh, we have great support here in the city. Uh, we've proven that over the past uh, fall with food banks in our own area. Uh, so I encourage every community group, every organization, anybody who can give anything to help out to get egg back on these feet and get this food to the people in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador that need it. And I guess there's, there might be a room for the provincial government to help for the short oh, term, right? Hey, by all means, if they can help. I uh, know Seamus uh, Regan put out a call today on his uh, website, and he got drop off at his place. And I'm sure all the cities and municipalities in the city, yeah. because we serve a lot of cities around uh, Newfoundland and Labrador, if they can gather up, like fire departments, their local municipalities, any... In any organization that could help us would be great. Right. And we'll do our best to help Egg out. As Listen, much as we can. I really appreciate your time. I know it's really freezing out here, but thank you for your perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. I was at home and I just got a really bad headache. I said, there is something wrong. Hi, I'm Debbie. 14 years ago, I had a brain aneurysm. And within a week, I had a stroke. This is my story.
She was 36 years old when she suffered a brain aneurysm and stroke in 2004, and it changed Debbie Maloney's life. Here now is checking back in with people who've shared their stories of overcoming life-altering events. Tonight, in the second segment of our series, This Is My Story, Debbie and her partner, Glenn Parsons, last spoke to Here and Now just a couple of years after her medical emergency. Have a look. I cried a lot. I think it was hard because I couldn't communicate. I couldn't tell people how I felt. And um, I would point to things, and a lot of people couldn't know, they couldn't understand what I was trying to say. It was really hard. It's still hard. Every day yeah. it's a battle. And people, people from the outside, you know, would say, oh, well, she's doing better. Well, yeah, she has come a long way, but you don't know what we battle through every day. Mm -hmm. Hey, Deb, it's tough. Well, that was Debbie Maloney about a dozen years ago. And here's a look at what life is like for her now. Here's the next part of our ongoing series, This Is My Story. I was at home and I just got a really bad headache. I said, there is something wrong. It really affected the right side of my body. It was hard because I couldn't communicate. I was in a wheelchair thinking oh my god like I'm too young. Hi I'm Debbie. 14 years ago I had a brain aneurysm and within a week I had a stroke. This is my story. I had um, what's called aphasia. It affected my language, like my reading, my spelling, all that kind of stuff. I went to the Miller Center for three or four months. I had um, physiotherapy and I had some speech therapy. Seven, eight, nine, one, two, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah. It helped a lot. It was hard trying to um, walk again. I still have trouble with my leg. I get Botox every three or four months, and it kind of relaxes the leg. If I walk now, it's with a bad limp. It takes me a longer time to go for a walk. I still have a limp. I'll be there forever. It's harder to put my thoughts, ideas together. Um, I find that I really get stuck on words. Even with having this interview with you, it, um, it's, it's, it's overwhelming. A lot of friends, they understand what I, what's going on with me, right? So um, being around new people, I would have to tell them exactly what's my, what aphasia was all about, how it affected my writing. Writing, you gotta get rid of that one. Speaking. See, the wrong words come out, right? I lost my license after my stroke. I remember the policeman came to my house and wanted to take my license. Um, that was upsetting too. Being young and all these things happen, it was just hard. Um, but I knew I couldn't anyway. I needed to have all that physio and um, with time I got it and um, then I got a new house, a new <laughs> car. <laughs> I think at the age of 36, I can't, like, I had to do something. I had to get better. You know, no, nothing is 100%, but um, a lot of that therapy, really, I needed it. A job is a big part of you. 
I was an x-ray technologist. It was a very physical job and a x-ray technologist is supposed to be their support patients and I couldn't do it. I'm doing some volunteering with the SPCA. I've been at that four or five years now. Yeah, I'm at a thrift store up on Topsail Road. It's nice that it's volunteering. All the money goes to the SBCA thrift store. $18, please. Thank you. You're welcome. See you now. It's just nice to be up just to help out. We've got a little dog. Spoil rotten. Uh, we have a new cabin, so we go up there a lot. It's like a new little house, actually. We loved it. We go up there a lot. It's still hard at times, but he supports me and he makes me laugh. I'd say I've done about 10 speeches. I, um, I did a lot of um, provincial, national conferences. In the beginning, I used to do them, and I would really get stuck on things, but I would make, make light of it. Still laughing. <laughs> and I would speak to people, like probably hundreds of people, and if I'd say a word, and i say, okay, everybody, this is my aphasia. I'm going to say the wrong words, and I found it just relaxing. I didn't mind it at all, you know? But um, it's part of it. It's still part of me. In the first couple of years, I used to see a lot of improvements. Um, then it got to the point that even with my speech therapy, that um, there was nothing else yeah, kind of leveled off. Sure, it's frustrating. My life is different, but I'm okay with it. Without Glenn, I'd never have gone this far. He was with me all the time. He was in the therapy with me. Um, I'm just lucky. What an inspirational story, and thanks so much to Debbie for sharing her story. Well, the next segment of This Is My Story will air in a couple of weeks and will feature Billy Woods, who lost his left arm in a farming accident 22 years ago, and he later bowled his way to a national title.
The two young railway fanatics doing their bit to keep Newfoundland railway history alive. Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. This weather update is brought to you by Beltone, helping the world hear better. Welcome back once again, Ashley. We've been hearing about those awfully cold temperatures in the rest of Canada, <laughs> certainly uh, in, in the center, isn't it? In That's the right. Ontario region, Ontario. mostly. Mm -hmm. We're not going to get any of that, are we? Well, uh, it, we will see these colder temperatures start to make a return, but they're not going to be quite as cold as what Ontario is seeing. So if we take a look at the upper levels of the atmosphere, you can see where that cold is centered with that deep purple. Now take a look at where it heads as we head towards the weekend. So we'll start to see that effect of those colder temperatures. Most of the cold will be up through Labrador, but when we start to see these colder temperatures, that's when we get into a lake effect set or a sea effect setup. So we can start to see that make its way uh, on the future tracker through the night on uh, Thursday night and into Friday as well. We'll see bands of uh, potential snow squalls keep uh, continuing right through the day on Friday mainly the west coast, parts of the south coast, but the Avalon could see that as well through the day on Friday, even into Saturday. So here's what I have as far as the setup goes. So along the west coast, south coast, could see locally about five to 10 centimeters of snow with some of these squalls. And then that potential snow squall set up for parts of the Buren and then the Avalon as well as we head towards Friday. So definitely something to keep an eye on. So I definitely have uh, flurries in the forecast for the Avalon. Minus six should be your afternoon high. So we are going to see those temperatures plummet uh, into Friday. Otherwise, down to the minus double digits through the rest of, uh, well, most of Newfoundland anyway, down through the Buren Peninsula, uh, seeing those temperatures in the minus single digits, similar to what we're going to see for the Avalon. And then up through Labrador, minus 20 for Lab City. Eventually we will start to see those cooler temperatures move in. Happy Valley Goose Bay minus 18 and then Cartwright sitting at minus 16 but it does look like plenty of sunshine up through that area. So taking a look at the future tracker we can see it's still alluding to the fact that we are going to see those snow squalls continue right even into Sunday uh, rather Saturday afternoon along the west coast as we continue to see that onshore flow and colder upper atmosphere temperatures and then that's exactly what we're going to see through Sunday as well, generally uh, with that potential for a few peaks of sun in the mix through parts of Newfoundland and Labrador as well, right through Monday afternoon. So taking a look at your five day forecast, there's that temperature for tomorrow, three degrees. Winds will pick up late day though, gusting upwards of about 70 kilometers per hour. And then that potential for squalls I have there, minus six. And then staying in the minus single digits right through Monday with the peaks of sun and cloud and then that potential for flurries as well. Now through central Newfoundland, a uh, few breaks of sun in the afternoon before we see a return of the potential for some snow as we head towards the evening hours. You can see that temperature is going to drop down and then Friday snow as well into Saturday and Sunday with a return of that sunshine on Monday. Western Newfoundland going to stay generally gray and windy right through Saturday with that potential of snow squalls. Again, anywhere from five to 10 centimeters is possible in some of the heavier squalls. And then Eastern Labrador going to hang on to those uh, temperatures tomorrow, going to dip back down and then sunshine as we head towards the rest of the week. And that's the same for Western Labrador. Temperatures dropping down tomorrow and then staying cold right through next week. So let's look at your forecast. I'll have your weather photo when I come back again. Thanks again, Ashley. Well, as you heard earlier, there was a short hearing for Kirk Keeping at court in Grand Falls, Windsor today. He appeared by video link. Keeping is charged with first degree murder, accused of killing his ex-partner, Chantel John, earlier this month in Con River. Despite the brief court session, some of John's family made the two hour drive to be there, including her aunt, Veronica McDonald said for what we have to come to see what happened to my niece to see the man that did this to her and hope that he get the time that he deserved for what he'd done and put our family through. He have some hard days, hard nights, people got to go to the clinic for medication and it's like it's a constant reminder when you drive past the place and think about he came into our community and did this to one of our people. Is there any is there any way to get away from it? Is it possible to have a moment where you don't think about it? 
No, I don't think it is because you go to bed and you're thinking about it. You wake up at night and you're thinking about it. So there's a constant, constantly on your mind what you do that you can see and think of the suffering that you've done. And for my sister, it's worse because she was there at the time it happened. And he came into her home and done this, you know? So that's the, that's the sad part. He had no right to be there in the home or in our community at that time. I hope the, or not, the courts are not lenient on this guy because he deserved to be put away for a long time so he can't hurt anyone else. You let those people go free, and they will be out to get someone else. How many people came with you today? There was 10 of us in court as family members. Some couldn't make it today for other reasons, and some just don't have the heart to show up and be faced with this man. It's, it's a long drive from... It's a long drive. It's about a two-hour drive. We was up since 5 o'clock this morning just knowing we had to come over here today. Lack of sleep last night. I'm thinking about today. And then ongoing today and go and you know it's just a short thing that went on in court but it's going to be prolonged for quite a while as I think so anyway. Are, are you fearful of that, that this is going to take a really long time to resolve? I don't like the idea of it's going to take a long time because the time that he's serving in to jail now is going to be part of what he's going to be sentenced to do. This will be taken off his time which I don't like that either. Kirk Keeping is in custody at Her Majesty's Penitentiary in St. John's. He faces one count of first-degree murder and has yet to enter a plea. That case will be back in court in two weeks. In national news, the next Francophonie Games were supposed to be held in New Brunswick in 2021, but the province says it's uh, no longer willing to host. The Premier blames skyrocketing costs and a lack of support from Ottawa. This was not an easy decision. However, without the additional funding from the federal government, which has a significantly greater physical capacity than a small province like New Brunswick, the added cost of the Games were always going to be a very steep hill to climb. The initial cost of the Games was $17 million, split between the province and Ottawa, but it ballooned to $130 million. Earlier this week, the organizing committee said it had reduced that by almost half, but Higgs says there was no guarantee costs wouldn't rise again. Canada's biggest stock exchange has done something new. The TSX held an old-fashioned draw today to decide who gets to use three coveted letters. The letters P-O-T, or POT, were up for grabs as a ticker symbol. And with 60 cannabis companies on the exchange, it generated a lot of buzz. So the TSX held a lottery for the letters. The winner has not been revealed yet, but they'll have 90 days to start using POT or pass it on. Time now to check back in with Anthony, who's in Mount Pearl this evening at the scene of that awful fire the community food sharing association anthony yeah. many people online are talking about how can they donate to the food bank well i'm going to get to that in just a minute i mean we've basically kick-started a new way you can go to our website and i'll give that information in a moment so far we've seen really the impact of this fire from uh, the big picture but i want to zoom in and the person who's going to help me do that is bob lovett who's been good enough to meet us here bob you actually run one outlet, right? Tell me about that. Yes, well, I operate uh, Mary Queen the World on Topsail Road. Um, I'll give you some statistics. Now, last year we supported something like 1,400 um, families for the year, and I would think that every hamper that we gave out, there was probably four supermarket bags of groceries that came through this uh, warehouse here. So that would turn into probably 5,500 to 6,000 uh, grocery s supermarket bags for the year and that's just our food bank. Imagine if you lined 5,600 supermarket bags along the road in a row. That's the impact we'd have, right? Yeah, well, you paint you paint quite a picture. Yeah. Uh, and obviously, the warehouse here is uh, is the place where the food was stored. But your your food bank's not very far from here, right? No, we're only five minutes out the road. Now you mentioned statistics, but maybe Bobby, give me a sense of some of the people that you've helped in your food bank. Any stories that stand out? People who come to you to say, "Hey, I really need some help." 
oh my god there's a whole lot of stories and there's almost like the naked oh, I'm at this eight years there's almost like the naked city there's eight million stories in this series and this has been one of them right. you know there's people of all walks of life all kinds of miserable situations that need help and we just don't ask any questions ok you need help what do you need ok we'll see what we can do for you so and that's like sometimes from here especially we get things for the people from the warehouse that we don't stock as standard items right. uh, like detergents and things like that and they're really glad to have them you know yeah. mixed necessities necessities yeah. right yes yeah well, let me ask you this as someone who's been involved in trying to help people and distribute food and necessities what was your gut feeling when you heard there'd been a, there was a fire here I said, uh oh, there's going to be a lot of people shortchanged on food because, like I said, some of the stuff that we get from them, we don't give out, we don't stock as standard items. So basically, the people are going to have to find an alternate supply of them. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's just your food bank? That's just my yeah. food bank. Like, can uh, St. Peter's up the road here in Mount Pearl, they, their numbers are comparable to ours. So you're talking 11,000 uh, bags of grocery for the for Mount Pearl region. Well, hopefully things are going to get fixed. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Thank Bob. you very much. Thank you right, very that's, much. That's Bob. Now, Debbie, you'd asked how can people help. Go to our webpage, cbc.ca slash nl, and uh, scroll down. You see the community section, and you'll see a donate thing there that you can click on. Well, our weather photo today looks like a painting. It doesn't even look real, does it, Debbie? No, it, it looks magical. It really does. Oh, I would have loved to have seen this in person. <laughs> Well, no clue as to where that no. is. I don't, it's I don't. all about the sky. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. I will tell you who took this photo and where it was taken when we come back. Well, there's our beautiful weather photo for the day. It was actually taken in New World Island, so a sunset over the beautiful shot there. Thank you so much, Dennis, for sending that photo in. Oh, that is a beauty. You could hang that on the wall. I, I definitely would. <laughs> <laughs> That's our program. Thanks so much for being with us, uh, and we'll see you back here tomorrow.